Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Let me start with Macro Thoughts and Northman Trader, who's a tremendous wag. Markets rally on virus optimism as the infection spreads, he said. And of course, viruses do exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics, as I wrote on the 27th of January. Home thoughts, given what we're seeing happening in 2020, I went back to Salman Rushdie's imaginary homelands. Ours is the most cryptic of centuries. Its true nature, a dark secret. And to T.S. Eliot, because Dr. Tedros uh, reminds me of this. Here we go round the prickly pear, prickly pear, prickly pear. Here we go round the prickly pear at five o'clock in the morning. It certainly feels like a decade of semiotic arousal when everything it seemed was a sign, a harbinger, of some future radical disjuncture or cataclysmic upheaval. But let us divert briefly into Carlos Cruz Diaz, who I must say I discovered this last year and I thoroughly appreciate. This is the Induction Chromatique à Double Frequence à Port Warn. And this is the Induction du Rouge Museo de Arte Contemporaneo in Caracas, in Venezuela. And now this is night view through a chromoscope in Paris. The chromoscope is an instrument for us to carry as we would carry a spyglass. It is an instrument intended to operate the transfiguration of the nocturnal landscape of large cities, deserted streets and all that, if you look at the Chinese cities. And uh, from there, I went to a quote by Carl Sagan, which Andrew Mazanzi reminded me of. It is far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in delusion however satisfying and reassuring. Um, I came across this when my uncle passed away, Firoz Manji, who I remember again. Firoz was a chef, an Italian chef, an aesthete, um, and uh, really a tremendous uh, fellow. When I was 13, I stayed with him and my auntie Nassim in Hampstead. And uh, those memories are really some of my fondest. We're like butterflies who flutter for a day and think it's forever. If you look at it, you see a dot. That's here, that's home, that's us on it. Everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever lived, lived out their lives, the pale blue dot. We succeeded in taking that picture, and if you look at it, you see a dot. Color, couleur additive, Carlos Cruz Diaz again. Uh, he says about color evolves continuously in time and space. I want people to realize that color is not a certainty, but a circumstance, he said. Red is maybe red, it's not the same if you hold an object under the sun as when you hold it in the shade. A major protagonist in the field of kinetic and optical art, a movement that encourages an awareness of the instability of reality. His body of work established him as one of the key 20th century thinkers in the realm of colour. Carl Sagan in Cosmos, the nitrogen in our DNA, the calcium in our teeth, the iron in our blood, the carbon in our apple pies were made in the interiors of collapsing stars. We are made of star stuff and of course Rumi intuited that 
when he said we come spinning out of nothingness, scattering the scars like dust. Good evening from Westlands, Nairobi, Kenya. This is from Jambo magazine. Joan Rollins, who was Kenyan for many years, could not recognize Westlands, but that is around Westlands Roundabout, um, which many years ago, um, my aunt had a little, uh, she had a travel shop just around the corner from there, so I remember it well, though I was brought up in Mombasa. Okay, let's go to political reflections. Speaker Pelosi rips up a copy of President Trump's SOTU 2020 speech after the address. This is a short video from Reuters. 4th of November, I was speaking about Speaker Pelosi and Trump's moniker for her nervous Speaker Pelosi, which is a linguistic transference of a sort. He, of course, would not shake her hand. Nevertheless, Trump's Gallup News rating just hit a new high for his presidency. This is from Bianco Research. And um, I think the economy is doing well enough for him to get carried to a second term in November. If the situation improves, he will take credit. If it worsens, blame will be blamed on Lee Kekwang, said Vivian Shue to go through The Guardian. Xi Jinping has been noticeably absent from public view as his government scrambles to fight the coronavirus outbreak that claimed more than 400 lives and has infected more than 20,000 people. His most recent public appearance was on the 28th of January when he met the Director General of the World Health Organization in Beijing and said he was personally commanding the response to the outbreak. Xi does not appear to be the face of the government's fight against the virus. He has not been pictured visiting hospitals, doctors or patients. Uh, photos of a long convoy prompted rumours over the weekend that Xi was on his way to Wuhan. He has yet to turn up. For a leader whose face and words decorate banners and signs across the country and feature in state media daily, the low-key approach during a time of national crisis seems out of character. This is clearly one of the most serious issues to confront China in decades. Xi has heavily centralized power in himself, cultivated a populist image, and vested himself with the title of people's leader, said Karl Minster. Failing to publicly address the issue would seem likely to harm his populist image. If the situation improves, he will take credit. If, he worse, if it worsens, the blame will be pinned on Li Kek Wang. I wrote about uh, sort of the apogee for China when it turned 70 on the 7th of October. I quoted Delilo, longing on a large scale makes history. 27th of May, I was describing how in one fell swoop, Xi was president for life, and I said he's on a pedestal. Um, and uh, they, you know, that was when they proposed to remove the expression that the president and the vice president of the People's Republic of China shall serve no more than two consecutive terms from the country's constitution. In one fell swoop, he was president for life, and I said he's on a pedestal and is faced with the strongman conundrum the political brand will not permit a retreat, let alone a surrender. So he's in a trap, big time, and it's a huge political risk. And the question is whether he becomes the, the lightning rod, and the party will surely make him that lightning rod if they feel that they're at risk, which given the way things are going, they certainly are going to be at risk took me back to Ecclesiastes, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. WHO's Dr. Tedros, and I really, his career is now one of ignominy, 
Without better data, it's hard to, for us to assess how the outbreak is evolving. Well, he keeps making pronouncements about how to deal with it or what impact it could have and to ensure we are providing the most appropriate recommendations. They aren't. That's the point. And that took me to Ozymandias, who I think best describes Dr. Tedros. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of the, that colossal wreck. Boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. I suspect there's an enormous revolution within the organization. A Wuhan doctor's conversation leaked. Emergency ward becomes mortuary. Nobody handles the body. Crematorium is too busy. Only admitted patients can be tested. Government only gives 2,000 testing kits to entire Wuhan per day. Many patients pushed away without being tested or diagnosed. And I've written about the non-linearity and exponential risks. And this point was made by Taleb, was explaining to an option trader, and I wish Taleb would pick up the phone to Tedros, why virus comparisons are inadequate. You must never compare deltas when gammas are very different. This coronavirus has a high gamma, straight Jensen's inequality, he says. That's why viruses, as I said, exhibit non-linear and exponential characteristics and why this one had escape velocity, because they were not dealing with it at the time when they could have done something about it, which was late November, early December. Two weeks ago, the number of known confirmed cases was about 300. Right now, we're pushing 25,000, at this rate, 30,000 by the weekend, or even before seems possible, David Inglis uh, tweeted. However, the numbers are probably 10x, because it's an issue of data capture. Confirmed deaths related to the coronavirus. This is from David Inglis again earlier this morning. Japanese health minister, they tested 31 people on the cruise ship and 10 came posit back positive. That's one out of three, or one third. They were sent to the hospital, Bianco Research. They're now going to test another 273 exhibiting symptoms. 3,500 others are left waiting for a resolution. 27th of January, I said the number is massively undercounted. Of that, we can be sure. Comparativist. Um, coronavirus is fatal in 5-7% to 7 of confirmed cases in Wuhan but less than 1% across China when you remove the Wuhan numbers. Hypothesis 1. Wuhan hospitals are overwhelmed, so more infected people die. Tick. Hypothesis 2. 5% is the real number, and Chinese provinces are hiding hundreds of deaths. That's the lethality mathematics. Have a look at this short video from RFA underscore Chinese to give you a flavor of why and how they're hiding these dead bodies. As I said on the 27th of January, Groucho Marx, who are you going to believe? Me or your own eyes or Tedros or the Chinese? Take your pick. Notice deaths versus recovered in Wuhan, it's about one to one. Everywhere else in China, very few die and everyone recovers. Miracle or cooked statistics? Let's hope it's the former, Anil Vora 69. This is a video of Hu's Global Infectious Hazard Preparedness Division head. Says the outbreak of the deadly novel coronavirus which has spread from China to two dozen countries, does not yet constitute a pandemic. When it will, we don't know, because they're not applying the science to it at all. This is a couple of responses. Have a 
click on that link because the responses are, you know, it's, this woman is high, says Quantum Turtle 2, perhaps do the next conference from China, that will reassure us, N. Maher 36. Now, another report, public health officials should anticipate new cases in new countries to soon be reported based on a correlation between geolocated data from a group of Twitter users from Wuhan and the original location of previously reported cases of the virus. <clears throat> Based on our research, we anticipate new cases of coronavirus to soon be reported. Our main message to health officials is that if your city is on the map or close to where the study's Twitter users visited, draw up plans to sensitize the population and health providers to the possible emergence of the 2019 novel coronavirus, particularly in patients with a history of travel to Wuhan. And this is also something that's got to be applied to Africa where they're hiding the numbers for sure, and I know that. Institute Pasteur has sequenced the whole genome of the coronavirus known as 2019 NCOV Around 20 other sequences of the novel coronavirus genome have been obtained worldwide and if we compare them with ours, we can see that they are all very close. There is not much diversity, this is interesting, in the viruses analysed which suggests that coronavirus 2019 NCOV did not need to mutate in order to adapt and spread, continues Vincent on OOF. The rapid growth of the culture, Institut Pasteur, may be explained by the high viral load in the samples. We could see the cells becoming damaged and then grouping together, which can indicate that they had been infected, but we did not observe the cytopathic effect for all the inoculated samples. That reassured us that we had managed to isolate the strains and this was then confirmed by additional analyses. On the left, a cell layer not damaged by the viruses. On the right, a cell layer with a visible cytopathic effect. The cells infected by the virus have been destroyed. Confirmed Xinjiang coronavirus cases jumped to 10. Xinjiang, which is a concentration camp, Amid concerns of spread in internment camps, Radio Free Asia via Senator Tom Cotton. A virus traced back to China's Hubei province has infected 10 people in the country's Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, where experts warned that poor conditions at internment camps could lead to an epidemic after authorities confirmed the first two cases in the region last week. I can't even sleep. If the virus spreads into the camps, they will not survive. There will be mass death. China's Xinjiang concentration camps are the ultimate breeding grounds for coronavirus, said Senator Tom Cotton. As I've written previously, the Chinese dream has become a nightmare at the boundaries of the Han Empire. And previously I said, I'm sure Z sees Hong Kong and Taiwan like a virus and he is looking to impose a quarantine just like he has imposed on Xinjiang. He's not imposing a quarantine, he's allowing the virus to feed into these places. Z is building an algorithmic society, which is an interesting point um, that I've noticed a few people pick up on in that they can identify you and your whereabouts from your mobile phone records. But overall, what is clear is that the CCP suppressed information until we reached a Groucho Marx, who are you going to believe me or your own eyes moment. Censorship is widely spread in China. In this video, CCP police checking cell phones to make sure no videos were taken and nothing is getting out to the outside world. The British the FCO, if you're in China and able to leave, you should do so. FCO travel doesn't get more direct than that. The French have said something similar. Global Times News can't help farting. 
Well, try harder because infrared temperature sensors recently installed in airports and train stations to monitor temperatures of passengers and coronavirus outbreak and screen them all. Of course, it is, there is a fecal transmission on a more serious point. The world has a new hyper-connectedness. We've speak, spoken about this and essentially I saw Dubai had its first year-on-year -year reduction in air, airline traffic. It's going to crater this year and all those sort of hubs are going to be in serious trouble. This chart by Cakesons count 59 airlines from 44 countries and regions have announced they're suspending some or all flights to the Chinese mainland. Let's move on to the financial markets. The euro dollar 110.37, dollar index around 98, Japanese yen 109.33. It sort of softened up yesterday, but I think that will reverse again. Swiss franc and it will strengthen. Swiss franc 0 0.9688, the pound uh, 130.32. The Australian dollar 0 0.6740, India rupee 71.244, South Korean won 1190.96, the Brazilian real 425.51, Egyptian pound 15.7995, and the South African rand 14.8158. And I think that's going to 1550 on a violent China emerging market South Africa backwash phenomenon. Dollar index uh, 97.991, notwithstanding that huge dump of liquidity, it still remains strong. Imagine if that liquidity had not been there. Euro dollar, this chart is from FX Pip Titan 110.36. At its peak yesterday, Tesla's market value of $175 billion was $5 billion higher than the value of all of Bitcoin, Charlie Bilello. That took me back to my favorite quote about the parabola. It is a curve each of them feels unmistakably. It is the parabola they must have guessed once or twice, guessed and refused to believe that everything always collectively had been moving toward that purified shape latent in the sky, that shape of no surprise, no second chance, no return. Over 58 million shares traded yesterday in Tesla, the highest volume day in its history. It ended the day up only 13.7% or $107. At its peak, it was up $190. I go back to a tweet which was so prescient, but I didn't do anything about it. October 26, and have a look at where the price was then. I said, I have to commend Tesla's Elon Musk for teaching the world about what a short squeeze really looks like and feels like the Tesla chart, I said, looks like a SpaceX launch and it just went straight up. Tesla's up 170% since last November when David Einhorn questioned whether its accounts receivable even exist and he must have been carried out. Commodity markets on the 13th of January, before this blew up, the virus, I mean, I said 2020 opens with a bang. That was a Soleimani assassination. Given the uncertainty I've outlined, gold looks well underpinned and might even have a banner year. And I know we slipped off yesterday and caught a lot of people off guard, fell about 1.5%, but we're back at 156125 and I think we're going to do well this year. Crude oil settled at $49.61 yesterday. It's in a bear market. It was up quite sharply before it came off. The close below $50 is the first since January 8, 2019. I think it's headed below $40. And that's on a sharp slide, 3 million barrels or so of demand out of China. It's just huge and unprecedented. Emerging markets, Brazil trade, this is what happens when your business model is selling iron ore 
and soybeans to China. That's from N. Paul McNamara. And I think that's why I'm a seller of the Real. Lebanon's $1.2 billion bond due on March 9 continues to rally. It's now back to 90 cents on the dollar. Investors seem to be getting more confident it will be repaid. Anshu Jain raising capital on behalf of Yes Bank in the midst of a novel coronavirus outbreak is the dystopian future I never asked for, Tracy Alloway. There are no confirmed cases of coronavirus in the African region. Surveillance remains a top priority and WHO continues to investigate alerts from member states. Eight alerts being investigated, 17 previous alerts discarded. As I said on the 27th of January, and we're a long way from there now, I have to assume that the virus is already in Africa, just not diagnosed. That's a racing certainty. Watch Prime Minister Netanyahu's remarks at the joint statements today with the Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni fifth visit, according to that uh, video, um, a decision by Malawi's constitutional court to annul last year's election on the grounds that they were rigged, sparked celebration in the streets and gave a fillet to democracy on a continent where political processes are all too often abused. I think this is a really big deal. The days of politicians playing fast and loose with electoral law are clearly numbered. Gary Van Staden, an analyst at NKC African Economics based in Pal, South Africa. A study of 44 nations on the continent carried out by Nick Cheeseman, a professor of democracy and international development at the University of Birmingham, showed almost every criterion used to evaluate the state of democracy slipped between 2015 and 2017. The judges were scathing of the country's electoral commission, saying it was incompetent, had abrogated its duty, and had discarded the constitutional rights of voters. Its actions greatly undermined the integrity of the election. Mutharika stole this vote. He was helped by some people who love money more than the country, Chuck Wera told supporters at the party's headquarters in Lilongwe and was broadcast on the party's Facebook feed. What happened yesterday is not my victory. It's a victory for Malawi and a victory for Africa. And I think that's right. Um, Maliseni, 22, who cast his ballot for Chilima last time and took part in opposition celebrations in Blantyre, where my mother-in-law is, the commercial capital on Tuesday, said the court's decision meant my vote has been reclaimed and I'm ready to vote again. This time I'm very hopeful it will be a fair election. So I think it's a very big deal and a, probably a sign of a trend reversal. Um, celebrations at MCP Opposition Party headquarters on Tuesday in Longway. That video credit is Cyrus Enhara via Haru Matassa. Uh, another video of celebrations. Uh, the characters in these videos look very happy and joyful. Again from uh, Cyrus and Haru. Um, of course, the Constitutional Court annulled the May 2019 presidential vote that declared Peter Mutharika a winner. Angola's ex-president's son detained over $1.5 billion corruption case. State prosecutors in Angola ordered Jose Filomeno dos Santos to be remanded in custody on Monday over a corruption case involving $1.5 billion in fraudulent transactions. The evidence assembled in the case constitutes sufficient evidence that the accused were involved in acts of corruption. Dos Santos, nicknamed Zenu, headed Angola's $5 billion sovereign wealth fund after being appointed to the post in 2013 by, would you believe it, his father. Now, um, 14th of October, I was using Ozymandias in a description of some of the debt profiles in Africa and some of the fact that our people were not getting realistic. 
and I was quoting Ozymandias, and I said the canary in the coal mine is Zambia. Have a look at this. This is admittedly 24 hours old. I haven't rechecked copper prices, but Tavi Costa copper just broke down from 17 years support. Guinea President Alpha Conde delays the legislative election until March 1. Of course, President Ramaphosa was awarded the Grand Croix de l'Ordre National du Mérite on behalf of the Grand Master, His Excellency President Alpha Conde of the Republic of Guinea a few weeks ago. But there is an interesting backstory. The race is on for iron ore riches buried under an African jungle. It diverted through an Israeli fellow and now it's come back again for years. The massive iron ore deposits under Guinea's mountainous jungle were practically forgotten by the mining industry. All changed last year's investors from billionaire promoter Robert Friedland to legendary dealmaker Mick Davies converged on the country in a modern-day resource rush. For the first time in years, projects like Simandu, Guinea's crown jewel deposit, might finally be developed. There's a bauxite tycoon, Fadi Wesney, the mining legend Mick Davis, a former Extrata CEO, billionaire promoter Robert Friedland has been banging on about a huge copper deposit he has in the DR Congo, and the miner Rio Tinto. This is a photograph of the Simandu source via Rio Tinto. And of course, there was an article a few weeks ago which I quoted how Putin got a new best friend forever in Africa. Alpha Conde of Guinea had a favor to ask Vladimir Putin when the two presidents met at the inaugural Russia-Africa summit in the Black Sea resort of Sochi in October. I would like, if possible, to spend most of our meeting in a one-to-one -one format because I have things to say to you that are not worth discussing in such a large group, he said. My pleasure, said Putin, as aides began to herd the several dozen officials and reporters in attendance out of the room, leaving him and Conde alone with their respective translators. Russia is throwing its weight behind Conde's undeclared campaign that makes Guinea hold of the world's largest deposits of bauxite, a key raw material for making aluminium, the latest focus in a renewed tug of war among global powers for influence and profit across resource-rich Africa. Putin is widely viewed as a kind of guru in Africa, said Viktor Boyarkin, a former diplomat, an ex Roussel security chief who's known Conde for a decade said in an interview in Moscow, people come to him for advice. It's a poor country, 13 million described by the IMF as fragile with heightened risks of social and political instability. In a speech broadcast on state television, then Ambassador Alexander Bregadze called Conde legendary and argued that constitution should be considered immutable works akin to the Bible or Quran. Kremlin spokesman Peskov said Russia isn't involved in anything to do with Guinea's internal affairs. During a tense exchange in southern France, Emmanuel Macron told Conde he was concerned about the tensions that a possible third term would cause in Guinea and warned he'd be watching closely according to two people familiar with the conversation. Boyarkin blames the protests mainly on outside forces and has nothing but praise for Conde. I consider him a saviour for Guinea. Since the days of the Soviet Union, you have been alongside us, protecting us, Conde told Putin. And here you see a photograph of the two of them during a meeting on the sidelines of the 2019 Russia-Africa summit on October 24 in Sochi. And I wrote an article after that from Russia with Love, which spoke to the Russian intervention, uh, well, reinsertion into the African continent. South African all shares down 0.47% so far this year. <coughs> Dollar rand, this chart, uh, 14.8135. My target is 15.50 plus. Egyptian pound, steady as you like, 15.7999. EGX 30 minus 0.33% in 2020. Nigerian all share up 5.92%, coming off the boil. Ghana issued $3 billion of euro bonds 
uh, yesterday, investors placed around $14 billion of orders. $750 million tranche will amortize, have an average life of 40 years at a yield of 8.875%. That's a buy in the current world. One billion of 20, 2035 securities at 8%, that's a buy. 1.25 billion of 2027 notes at 6.375%, probably not. I prefer the longer data paper. Ghana stock exchange is down 2.04% so far this year. According to reports, Ethiopia and Kenya are battling this locust plague with just eight crop dusters. One plane can cover up to two kilometers, 2,000 acres a day, according to its application rate. That's from man underscore integrated. Best case, 16,000 acres per day are being sprayed. Just one of the swarms in Kenya is currently 592,000 acres in size. I wrote about Kenya where I said we're under a plague of locusts and Al-Shabaab attack. This is a map of where the locusts are. I saw Pakistan declared a state of emergency, so it's all the way up there as well. Exodus 10, the plague of locusts. If you refuse to let them go, I will bring locusts into your country tomorrow. They will cover the face of the ground so that it cannot be seen. They will devour what little you have left after the hail, including every tree that is growing in your fields. They will fill your houses and those of your officials and all the Egyptians, something neither your parents nor your ancestors have ever seen from the day they settled in this land till now. Luke 21, 11, there will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and pestilences and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. Revelation, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The Horn of Africa is suffering its worst desert locust outbreak in decades, says locust expert Keith Cressman of the FAO. If action is not scaled up urgently, more countries could be affected in the coming days. On the way to Nairobi, seen at Sagana, be ready to welcome them. This is a short video from Bernadette M. Bug. And that's why I said it feels like a decade of semiotic arousal when everything it seemed was a sign, a harbinger of some future radical disjuncture or cataclysmic upheaval. Have a listen to this video. It's quite interesting from Dume Singh, President Daniel Arap Moy, who passed away in the early hours of yesterday morning. There was a um, obituary in Bloomberg by David Herbling and Eric Ombok. He was born on September 2, 1924 in the village of Kurengueng in Baringo district, 155 miles west of Nairobi. His father, Kimoy Arab Chabi, was a herdsman whose ancestors had migrated from the slopes of Mount Kenya to avoid conflict with the Maasai tribe in the 19th century, according to Kenya's presidency. Fifth child of Kabon, senior wife of his father. From age four, when his father died, Moy was raised by his elder brother, Toy Toik, attended the African Inland Mission School when he was a stronger supporter of that mission, uh, requiring him to walk 28 miles from home, later transferred to mission and government schools in Capsabet, trained as a teacher heavily influenced by Christianity, became a head teacher at Cabernet before training others in his profession in government schools, entered politics in 1955, served on the country's legislative council under UK colonial rule. After Kenya gained independence in 1963, he was appointed Home Affairs Minister before Kenyatta appointed him as his deputy four years later. Kalenjin ethnic group, uh, uh, when Kenyatta died in August 1978, which I remember vividly because I was at Kenton, his pledge to follow a more nationalist agenda appealed to Kenyans 
who argued that Kenyatta's policies had favoured the Kikuyu and excluded other ethnic groups. Um, he first came in on a lot of optimism, freed political prisoners, cracked down on corruption. Um, after winning all elections as a member of parliament and as president since independence, Moy stepped down on December 30, 20, 2002 and handed over power, which is something not many leaders have done in Africa. Um, I was at school with one of his sons, Gideon, uh, ruled Kenya for almost a quarter of a century, but really clamped down on opposition groups, uh, fending off accusations of corruption and human rights abuses. Died at age 95. Kenyatta, it is with profound sadness and sorrow that I announced the passing of a great African statesman. Died at the Nairobi Hospital amended the country's constitution in 1983, abolishing the multi-party system. Uh, torture was widespread, driving Kenyans such as the novelist Ngugi Wathiongo into exile and others such as Raila Odinga, who served as prime minister during Kibaki's presidency two decades later into detention. What triggered that huge turnaround was a coup attempt by junior Air Force officers in 1982 oversaw the real entrenchment of a system of patronage in Kenya, John Githongo, very true, systematic destruction of our institutions, true as well, presided over the Goldenberg corruption scandal in the 1990s, which was a complete racket, a billion dollars went missing then, which was about 10% of GDP. So, you know, uh, very unhappy people in the north of Kenya where he, he was very brutal, in putting down, and there was a ma very famous massacre. Um, so, uh, very complicated, old school, Rwandans don't like him, he supported the Hutus um, uh, in uh, Rwanda. But uh, two photographs I wanted to share with you, one with Muhammad Ali, and the other kind of shows you that he was quite a strong personality in his own way. Consortium led by the IFC is set to acquire a 54.23% stake in AAR Healthcare Holdings just ahead of the outbreak of the virus, no doubt. 1.5 billion shillings. Kenya All Shares down 1.78%. Nairobi NSE20 down 1.97%. Year to date. Thank you for stopping by.